You know, a 10-year-old girl went out with a group of family and friends to see the, the Christmas light displays at various uh, locations throughout their city. And they stopped at one particular uh, church building where there was a very ornate and beautiful nativity scene out on the front, front yard. The grandmother of the little girl said, Isn't that beautiful? Isn't it just wonderful? Look at Mary and look at Joseph. And look at the baby Jesus. And she said, Yes, Grandma, it's, it's pretty. She said, But I, 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 I have a problem. She said, It's really nice, but there is one thing that bothers me, and it is that, is Jesus ever going to grow up? He's the same size that he was last year. You know, while the innocent observation of this 10-year-old girl might seem naive to us, for many people, even some who call themselves Christians, the concept of Jesus has never really grown up in their lives. It's never really grown up in their understanding. Their comprehension of Him is weak and inadequate, and as a result, they have, they have really lost sight of what He's all about. They've lost sight of God. You know, it is even possible, unless we stay on top of the issue, that some of us could hold a view of Him that is inadequate, inadequate to, to bring us to where we need to be for the salvation that He offers because of the need to keep the truth of Christ ever before us. This morning I want to go and review the facts. Review the facts about that babe in the manger who grew up to be the Savior of the world. And I want us to look at that from selected text out of John chapter 1. So you can just go ahead and open your Bibles there, and we will kind of look at certain texts from that chapter. In this chapter, John tells his readers at least four truths that comprise a mature, a grown-up, and an informed understanding of the Son of God. And this understanding this morning will allow us to let Jesus get out of the manger and get into our lives. So what then is the truth about Jesus and the manger? I want you to note first that John speaks about his identity. Verse 17 says, Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. Those two words, Jesus Christ, we read them over and over, we say them over and over, and yet they are so very key to our understanding of who He is. And they are some of the most common words, not just in our vocabulary, but they are some of the most common words even in our culture. They are uttered thoughtfully and respectfully by people of faith. And they are uttered as curse words by people that are unbelievers. The name Jesus is special. It was given supernaturally to this baby in the manger. Given to Mary by Gabriel in Luke chapter 1 and verse 31, he said, You shall name him Jesus. Given as well to Joseph in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21, where the angel said, You shall call his name Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. The name Jesus given by God means Savior. A clear reference to his identity as well as to his purpose. You know the word Christ, I heard a preacher one time say that he thinks a lot of people think that was Jesus' last name. But Christ is not Jesus' name at all. It is, it is his title. It is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew word Messiah. And John even helps us with that in this same chapter. In John chapter 1 and verse 41, Andrew told his brother Peter, We have found the Messiah. And then John tells us, which is translated the Christ. This word Christ or Messiah associated Jesus with more than 300 prophecies in the Old Testament regarding His coming and His purpose. And it is given to God, given to, by him, to him by God that he might be that from Genesis 3 forward to the time that he hung upon that cross. He is God's special messenger of salvation and sacrifice for all mankind. John also identifies Jesus by parentage. Look at verse 14. 
He says, And we beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father. Through Jesus, though Jesus was conceived and birthed by a human mother, His Father was God. Was Jesus just another human being? We hear people ask that out in the world. We see that on, on magazines at times. The real Jesus. Was Jesus just like any other human? And the answer to that is clearly no. He was conceived like no other man. He was and is the Son of God. He is not a Son of God. You and I are uh, the men in this room that have come to Christ. We are sons of God, but we are not sons of God in the same way that Jesus is the Son of God. And we need to understand that. We make, need to make certain that we do not make that mistake. Because verse 14 makes it very clear that He is the only begotten Son. He is the unique Son. That's what that word only begotten means. The word monogenes means that He is unique. There is no one else like Jesus Christ. There is no other person that has ever lived that is like Him. And there is no other Son that is like Him either. John also identifies Jesus in this chapter as the Word. Verse 14, he clarifies who the Word is when he says, The Word became flesh, and, we dwe and He dwelt among us. To view Jesus as merely just a great teacher, as some have tried to do throughout history, while perhaps well-intentioned, is to diminish His actual identity as the Word. He didn't just teach the Word of God. He is the Word of God. The physical expression of the Word and of God Himself. This is the baby born in the manger in Bethlehem that so many focus on in this season. And He is far more than just a cute story told in the middle of winter. He is someone that needs to grow up in our understanding of Him. We need to see His identity. Second of all, John shows us another fundamental truth, and that is Jesus' pre-existence. In verse 1 of our text, John says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. So the Word, which we've already established as Jesus Christ, existed in the beginning. And perhaps just so we wouldn't miss the point, John wanted to make sure to make this clear, didn't he? Because then he goes into verse 2 and he says, He was in the beginning with God. And this statement literally means that He existed before the beginning. That He is eternal, in other words. And we find the same truth elsewhere in Scripture when Jesus is accused by the Jews of making Himself to be greater than their revered ancestor Abraham. In John chapter 8, and verse 58, he says, Before Abraham was born, I am. And this was a reference to his pre-existence, to his eternal nature. Did the guys that he was talking to, did they get it? Did they understand what he said? Did they understand what he was implying? Well, from what we see there in that text, they absolutely understood what he was saying. Because they picked up stones and they were going to stone him because they knew and understood that the statement he made implied the eternal nature of deity. John the Baptist in our text this morning in verse 30 makes it very clear that he was before him. Now you've got to remember, right, that John the Baptist is six months older than Jesus and yet John says he was before me. He pre-existed me. This babe in the manger... This one identified as Jesus Christ and the Son of God existed before He took on flesh, before He was laid in a manger in swaddling cloth, He existed in eternity. Before He walked among us, He existed even before the foundations of this world and this universe was even laid and before time itself even began. He was there. He was there in all eternity. How could He do that? Well, that's the answer that John then gives us in our third fundamental truth this morning is that John shows us that Jesus is deity. Verse 1 says, again, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with, was with God, and the Word was God. Could there be a clearer statement 
of Jesus' deity. I think I could probably just read that and walk away, right? But preachers don't ever do that, do we? You know, I don't think so, and yet in spite of this clear statement, there are people who try to sidestep the issue of the deity of Jesus Christ. I remember I put on, on, on a... I did a test with the teenagers some years back, and I've done it several other times. I've even had adults want to take it. It's kind of a biblical aptitude test just to kind of see where you're at. But one of the questions at the end of it was, is Jesus God in every way that the Father is? And you would be surprised how many people put no. And that they have misunderstandings in regard to the deity of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Jesus told the Jews at the Feast of Dedication during this same time of year, in John chapter 10 and verse 30, He made the statement, I and the Father are one. And the Jews, once again, seemed like they were always out looking for rocks, right? Once again, they picked up stones to stone Him. Why would they do that? Why would they do that? Because Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Well, you don't have to wonder about that question because the Bible answers it for us. In verse 33 of that text in John 10, it provides their explanation for why they wanted to stone him. Listen to what it says. For a good work, we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. Because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. See, they got it, didn't they? They understood exactly what Jesus was saying, that He was saying, I am deity. And Jesus didn't come back there and go, no, you're misunderstanding what I'm saying. That's not what I said at all. That's not what He did at all, because what He said was the reality of the situation. You know, this idea that Jesus was God isn't something that the church made up sometime after His death or after the death of the apostles. If you watch the movie Da Vinci Code, uh, it's certainly not something that came after Jesus' life. It was there even when He walked on this earth. It was there and came from His very mouth that I and the Father are one. Paul made the same claim of Jesus' deity in Colossians chapter 1. The writer of Hebrews makes the same claim in Hebrews chapter 1. And John makes that claim in this text. And Jesus made the claim in John 10 and John 8. There can be no doubt that Jesus is God. The tiny, helpless baby in the manger, the one for whom there was not even room in the inn, was the Creator come to this earth. And folks, if that is a lie, (laughs) it's a whopper, isn't it? But if that is the truth of the matter, then there is no greater truth in this world than that truth. That brings us to the question, what was the Creator doing? What was He doing lying in a manger in a stable, cared for by peasant parents, one who wasn't even actually His parent, His father? He was here to fulfill His mission. Last Sunday morning, we examined one aspect of His his mission on this earth, and that was the aspect of Him showing us the Father in heaven to enable us to understand God in a manner that could help us uh, understand Him in a way that we could live for Him better, to enable us to be what God would have us to be. And John mentions this mission again in verse 14. It says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. God could have shown Himself in many ways, but he chose to in the life of Jesus. The other part of the mission of Jesus was to return men to the Father. To return men to the Father that had walked away from the Father, that had separated themselves from the Father by their choice to sin. Romans chapter 5 and verses 8 through 9, the Apostle Paul says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than then having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. Through Jesus, we are saved from the wrath of God. Jesus came to this earth to show us the Father, show us how to live, but those two things would have no value whatsoever 
if he did not die to reconcile us back to the Father. The text that was read just a few moments ago before the Lord's Supper about the resurrection, that if Jesus isn't raised from the dead, then all of this is worthless. And we are to be above all most pitied if we're living a life for Christ, if there's nothing after it. But it's the same for his death. If he doesn't die, if he doesn't shed that blood, if he's not the Lamb of God sacrificed to take away the sins of the world, then there is no reason for us to do anything we're doing for him. Because it can avail nothing. Because God has said that is what must be done. He came, as John the Baptist stated twice in in chapter 1, he came to be that Lamb that God provided to take away the sins of the world. That was not accomplished in a manger. That was accomplished on a cross when he died 30, 33 years later. Jesus' mission was not to live in a manger. He was to leave the manger so that we could see the Father. He was to leave the manger so that we could see home, the home that we strayed from because of our sins to see the path through Him to return to our Father through the forgiveness of our sins by the blood that He shed on the cross and to have a hope of all eternity in heaven one day with God because of the resurrection from the dead on that third day. Many in the religious world and even in the church sometimes fail to understand what's really important here. You know, there are times when the holiday, December 25th, lands on a, a Sunday, and, and it never fails that I, I see some that just cancel all of their services for that day. And it makes me wonder, is it more important to eat and to open presents than it is to worship the God that sent Him to die upon a cross for me? See, we forget sometimes that really the most important thing is not some day or holiday. It is the Savior that saves us. One congregation I know of said, we're not going to have a worship service. Instead, we're going to have a, a birthday party so everybody can celebrate instead of having to, having to worship. It's just for people while forgetting the Savior. We're here this morning not because of anything hopefully other than the love that we have for the one that hung on a cross. And yes, he was in a manger at the beginning. But you and I can sit here this morning as children of God because of the whole life that he lived. Because he got out of that manger. And he lived that life. And he died that death. And he rose from that grave. And he ascended back to the right hand of the throne of God. That's why we're here this morning. Do you recognize your Creator? Do you recognize your Creator in His day of visitation? Who are you looking at as you gaze in your mind's eye at that baby in a manger? Are those God's eyes looking back at, back at you, reaching out to communicate with you that He wants to save you? Is that what you see? I hope you do. And I hope you understand that that was done for you out of the love that God had for you. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to this earth for you, but you must reach out to Him to receive His offer of redemption. Will you accept Him as the few have done down through the centuries since His time upon this earth? Or will you follow the majority in a darkness of your own making? That's the question. That's why He came, to bring us out of darkness so that we could be translated as Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13 says from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son so that we could dwell in the glorious light of Jesus Christ the choice for your life today is yours and yours alone today God is calling you out of that darkness he's calling you into that glorious light Will you accept the offer? Will you let Jesus grow up? Will you let Jesus get out of the manger and get into your life as God? Will you let Him get out of the manger and get into your life as Savior, as Redeemer, 
and as Lord who has every right to tell you how you should live because He is God, because He has done all this for you. This morning, I hope and pray that you'll make that decision, that you'll let Him be those things for your life. That you'll let Him grow up so that He can be your Savior this morning. He came for that purpose. We hope and pray this morning, if you understand your need to come to Christ, to obey His gospel, His good news, and that it is great news. And we can celebrate every single day of our lives that we have heard the good news from Jesus Christ. The good news that I want to save you. Come to me. Matthew chapter 11. You can come to him this morning by believing in him. Repenting of your sins. Saying I'm not going to do those things anymore. Those are the things that Christ wants me to put away so that I can be like him. To confess him as the son of God. And understanding that in that confession you acknowledge that he is God. And that you can be buried in baptism this morning. Raised from there, having your sins washed away. The sins that He came to remove. The sins that He is the, was the sacrifice for. You can rise to walk a new life. Not for a baby in a manger, but for a Lord that died for you. This morning, if you're a child of God, maybe you've forgotten who you're serving. We will pray you'll make the decision to return to Him and let Him once again bring you back into a right relationship with your Father. If we can help you with that in any way, we want to do so. Why don't you come as we stand and as we sing.